I'm Rachel Sarnansky, Senior Sustainability Editor at Vogue Business. And I'm here today with designer Sammy Miro. Welcome, Sammy. Thank you so much. I am the designer, creative director, and owner of sustainable clothing line, Sammy Miro Vintage. Uh, we launched a few years back, and really the core of the brand and the company is doing better, having a really responsible ethos throughout our entire supply chain. Cool. Thanks for that. So, um, so let's, let's get started. You started your career wa- working in tech. Can you tell us about your transition and path to the fashion industry? Yes. So I am from San Francisco and I kind of went the traditional San Francisco route of, uh, you know, going to school. I went to uh, undergrad and grad school, uh, grad school for global entrepreneurship and management. And so I found myself working in a tech startup in San Francisco in uh, consumer electronics, and I loved it very much. I was always that girl in high school and in college and grad school and in the corporate world wearing weird, crazy vintage clothes and strange outfits, especially for the city of San Francisco, where it's definitely not a fashion forward city. Uh, And it was just kind of a part of who I was. It gave me an extraordinary amount of confidence when I was in high school, knowing that I was the only one in the world wearing this vintage jacket or a vintage t-shirt or whatever it was. And I was very, very far removed from the fashion industry uh, being in San Francisco. And I ended up moving to Los Angeles because I would travel constantly for that job that I had and I didn't have to be based in our headquarters. And I took the opportunity and moved to Los Angeles and met people in really creative industries who saw my weird style and encouraged me to get into the styling world And I had no idea what that meant. Uh, So I would, on the weekends, while I was still working for my corporate job, I would intern at different magazines and be the coffee runner and the assistant, assistant, assistant uh, to really just figure out fashion, learn about the brands. And I ultimately decided that there was something creative in me that I wanted to explore. And I decided to quit my corporate job and take a year of doing many different creative things, styling, uh, several things in front of the camera. And I realized within that year that I had a, an interest in design and that I had, I think, a unique perspective, especially in the world of sustainability and upcycling that hadn't existed back then. Uh, and so I started Sammy Miro Vintage really on a whim to be able to combine my business acumen and my past experience working for a startup and explore entrepreneurship for the first time, which was my ultimate goal, and also combine my newfound passion and desire to be in the fashion industry and design and put my ideas out there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think <clears throat> you've talked a little bit about already the the inspiration behind Sammy Miro Vintage, but um, you know, is there anything else just to, to say about sort of, yeah, how you how you came to that idea, what the where, what the inspiration was, and 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 also just your love for vintage clothing, where that came from. So I mean, my love of vintage clothing started when I was around thirteen or fourteen years old, um, and it stemmed from insecurity, to be honest. Um, I was a very, very shy, shy girl. And I wanted to wear the brands that all of the, you know, popular kids were wearing. And I did not come from a, you know, wealthy family like all of the other kids driving to school in their Range Rovers did. And so my um, father refused, so happy for this, but my father, you know, refused to buy me these fancy brands. So I ended up discovering vintage shops and thrift stores uh, as a means to kind of be able to wear the brands. But back then, you know, I, you know, I found like, for example, a five, 
dollar Lacoste polo. And back then Lacoste polos were everything, but my Lacoste polo had sun discoloration and sun damage and holes everywhere, which back then was not the cool thing at all. You just looked crazy in that. And it was, it was that shirt and the following vintage items that I ended up purchasing that made me recognize the fact that everybody else in school was wearing their brand new with tag items and mine was completely different than theirs and so although it was looked down upon from the my peers I found the beauty and knowing that there was a story behind the garment that I was wearing and that the wear and tear of it made it that much more special and so that is really what catapulted my change in style it gave me confidence and it just was kind of the beginning of what SMV is today and what it is that I do today. Although I was very, um, had no idea that it would become my livelihood. Um, And the other part, what was the other part to the question? The inspiration behind the brand, but I mean, you've talked about it. Um, Yeah, Um, inspiration. Well, so because my, I didn't go to fashion school. So my experience with designing was because I, my hand-me-downs were from my dad or my older brother. And I was wearing these, you know, super oversized men clothing. And I had to figure out how to make it look nice on my small figure. And so I was always cutting things up and pinning things and, Uh, since I was, you know, around 13 years old, or actually maybe even younger, uh, to make it work for me. And the inspiration when I when I realized that I wanted to start Sammy Miro Vintage, and when I wanted to, to explore design, for me, authenticity is everything. And it took me a little bit of time to figure out how to take something old and create something new out of it. Because like I was saying back then, upcycling was just not a thing. And once I kind of realized that I could take vintage denim jeans and cut it up in a million different ways and patch it together and create a garment out of it, I had an epiphany and I said, that is what Sammy Miro vintage is. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, really the beginning of how I got started and, um, And really the root of why I care so much about the planet and the people who work in the manufacturing facilities and, and really everybody who's a part of my company. So what are, what are some of the benefits of having a sustainable brand and, and also what are some of the challenges? What's been most challenging for you as the owner of a sustainable brand? Yeah, well, I guess we can start with the challenges because there, there are, I mean, here's the thing for me, because there is no other way, it works just great for me. (laughs) Um, There's a lot of education and new innovation in the industry, which is incredibly exciting, especially in the last few years. And it's just growing exponentially. Uh, And so it's, it's really important to stay on top of all of that and and uh, and stay with the new uh, technology and innovations that are out there. Uh, and it, I would say, the biggest challenge that that most brands would experience when transitioning from doing things the traditional way that's horrible for the planet into sustainability is that it's a lot more expensive. It takes a lot more effort. And so you could have, you know, a fabric, a, you know, like a, a cotton fabric or a terry fabric that one might use for a hoodie or sweatpants that costs X amount of money, but the uh, sustainable version is potentially 10 times more. Mm-hmm. So for a company who's transitioning, you have to be really ready to to deal with the financial uh, change within your business. And you have to, I think, really believe in it and and genuinely want that change uh, versus staying 
you know, doing what, what is on trend right now. And, uh, you know, the, the deeper you go into eco-consciousness, the more effort and time and money that it will take. Uh, another example is that there are a lot of sweatshops out there, even domestically and in, in Los Angeles, uh, as well. And if you want to be fully sustainable, you have to treat everybody working in the supply chain appropriately and you have to pay them appropriately. And that's a huge change for a lot of these companies as well, because, you know, their margin is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller with the more expensive fabrics, the higher wages. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a really big shift. Uh, so those are just a couple of, of examples. Um, but for me, I would say that the benefit is that I feel good and I feel like I'm genuinely doing something better. And I know that what my brand is doing is has a, a trickle up and trickle down effect to larger brands who are seeing a new way of doing things as well as new smaller brands starting starting their their business for the first time and saying you know this is you know potentially what Sammy Miro Vintage is doing I know this is better maybe that's how I should start my business and I think it's it's a really powerful thing for me to be fully transparent uh, this year we are starting a transparency program where we're essentially laying out every step of the way how we are doing everything and um, our supply chain is just I'm 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 really proud of it because there's no part of the supply chain that is harming the planet and you know we we choose responsibility in every step of the way as best as we can and as um, and everything that we have access to. So it makes me feel really proud. Some of what you were saying just now, I was curious what your uh, relationship with the with the customer is like, because, um, you know, this in the last year or so, uh, I can't tell you how many studies and surveys I've seen uh, saying that consumers care more than ever about sustainability, um, which is probably true sort of in... Um, you know, on some level, sort of theoretically, but um, but what consumers will pay for is a different story if they'll spend more on the sustainable thing. Um, and so I was just curious if you, you know, what your experience is uh, with consumers and what they are or are not willing to pay for. Uh, I mean, that is definitely an interesting study uh, all I really know is is my experience with Sammy Miro Vintage, but I would say that, you know, I would say that, well, this is, I have a few answers to this. I think what, what we have done with the brand is kind of for the first time or one of the very first to show how you can be sustainable or where it doesn't have to look traditionally sustainable. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, scream, okay, how do I say this? I would say maybe four years ago with sustainable brands, you could look at the clothes and you would know it's sustainable. It's very basic stuff, uh, very simple, you know, hoodies and t-shirts and sweatpants and, or, or things made out of linen. And uh, what we strive to do is also push uh, a fashion forward perspective while also being sustainable. So I think we get customers who care about both things. We get customers who buy from Sammy Miro Vintage with potentially no knowledge that we're sustainable, but they like our designs. And then we have customers who purchase Sam Miro Vintage because they want to give money to a company who cares about Mother Earth. <laughs> uh, so it's hard to say, but that's my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's um, it's it's helpful. I mean, everyone has a different <clears throat> uh, experience, so uh, so it's just always helpful to sort of share. Well, I uh, think also too is that. 
know, fast fashion has obviously completely changed the fashion industry. The level of consumption is just out of control. The price, the retail prices of garments is insane. And when you, when you backtrack and you think about how is this dress $10 and you think about all of the costs that have to go into it, the material development, the dyeing, the screen printing, potentially the, um, the labor. shipping, the, the right. yeah, the labor, the sewing, the, you know, so how much was this person getting paid to sew this $10 dress where they're still making money just off of a $10 retail value mm -hmm. and how many chemicals and horrible cheap materials are they using to create these, uh, these garments? Mm -hmm. So the, the issue with that is obviously the, you know, the landfills, the, the pollution, the chemicals going into our water systems, into the air with the microfibers. It's also that it's, it's skewed the consumer's perspective that things can cost less and potentially should cost less. And why doesn't everything cost this little? Uh, so it also is going to take a lot of educating to the masses and why it's so detrimental and horrible to the planet and why you shouldn't support support these fast fashion companies. Uh, but it will, there is a learning curve and I think it will take time. Um, it makes me very happy to know that people are caring more and they are more knowledgeable about it. But I think the, um, the magnitude of how bad it is for our planet hasn't really been hasn't really been publicized in the way that it should, mm -hmm. and I think that we're going to need, uh, uh, you know, laws will need to be made. I think the government potentially will have to get involved in order to really crack down on on the uh, supply chains of these uh, clothing companies. Right. Right. Well, that's a good segue, I think, just, you know, your, your comment about how, <clears throat> what the, what the impacts are of the industry um, on the planet. So can you just talk about what, you know, why is it important for the fashion industry specifically to adopt more sustainable practices and, you know, make changes that are, that are better for the planet? Yeah. So I definitely named a few reasons why, but you know, overall, the fashion industry is, is one of the most detrimental to our planet. And that comes with all of the pollution that comes with uh, all of the overconsumption and the extraordinary amount of, you know, it's like billions of pounds that are in these landfills because you buy a cheap mm -hmm. garment, you wear it once, it falls apart and you throw it away. And all of the billions of people out there doing that creates an extraordinarily unhealthy amount of waste that our earth is not built for. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also, like I was saying, garment workers, last year we were part of the Garment Workers Protection Act in, uh, in, getting, the, in getting it um, passed. And in Los Angeles, specifically with all of our uh, sweatshops that are here. So now it's an insane thought to me, but now garment workers in LA are getting paid minimum wage, at least like everybody else who works is getting paid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the treatment of these people who are taking ideas and the ones bringing it to life deserve to get paid correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, did I miss something? Can I answer we, that? Can we I can come that? back to it. <laughs> um, can I was at it later. So um, uh, what advice do you have for, for brands that are looking to incorporate sustainability? The advice that I would have for brands who are looking to import, incorporate sustainability is educate. Step one, educate yourselves on why it's important. Read the statistics and educate yourself on all of, there's infinite amount of ways to incorporate sustainability. Obviously, the more, the better. 
uh, and figure out what works best for your business and, and potentially give a timeline to, we, ha- we want to incorporate these 10 steps. How long will it take to get there? And what can we start doing now? Uh, and to really plan for it. And also not to greenwash. If you're doing one small thing, kind of, don't just use sustainability and eco-consciousness as, as a marketing tool. It's, it's important to be a, for a consumer, I think, at least this is how I think of it, to be able to trust who they're buying from. And greenwashing and trying to use this label of sustainability because it's trending and you might be able to sell more clothing doing it that way. You know, it really also just makes it harder for the brands who are actually doing it and not greenwashing. Um, I think that's an interesting uh, point. And it's a theme that has come up in my own um, reporting uh, that, that there is a sort of hunger for authenticity and, um, and, you know, vulnerability is how I've heard a lot of people talking about it, where, where people want brands to talk about what they are working on, you know, what they're trying to improve, but also acknowledging where they still have to improve and not claiming that, you know, a shoe or a dress or something is sustainable, but like, these are the things that we're doing. And then these are the things that are still not unsustainable and sort of owning up to that. Um, and, and, you know, being transparent about what they are working on. And it sounds like something you might, um, be practicing maybe, um, in your own brand or something that you see. Absolutely. Uh, like I said earlier, we strive to be eco-conscious in every step of our supply chain. And I would say, I mean, don't quote me on this right now because we are, working on our, our sustainable, or excuse me, we are working on our tra- transparency plan, um, which includes uh, carbon emission footprint and everything like that. But I would say that, you know, we are 90 plus percent doing things, the making the sustainable option to do things. And then the things that we're not, we're currently working on how to make them sustainable. So we are very, very, very high up there when it comes to to that and incorporating it in every aspect that we can. And do you um, do you find that customers re- reward you or or um, uh, or do do they punish you? It, you know, if you acknowledge that your that whatever it might be X thing about the jacket is um, not where you want it to be, like in that ten percent or whatever it might be. Um, do you, do consumers welcome that honesty or do you think they're like, well, actually, then I'll go look for this other jacket, even though that might be even less sustainable. (laughs) Right. Right. I, I have not experienced that at all. I think that our, uh, customers are extremely supportive of all of the things that we're doing because it's so much more than almost everybody else. And I think that they if anything, appreciate knowing which parts are we're working towards becoming more sustainable in. But I think your point is a really important one, is not claiming more than what you are actually doing because out of fear potentially that people may come after you for those things because it's I don't know that it's possible for any industry to be 100% sustainable if you are a growing scaling business, Mm -hmm. but it's been a very exciting process for us as we've been growing tremendously in the last two years to have to reconfigure and rework our ways of doing things on a small scale and make it work on a bigger scale and learning about all of these things and, and the new innovations out there is so exciting for me and so fun for my team as well. And we're really just a group of people in the company who all genuinely care about the ethos and, and the decisions that we make, even if it takes, you know, my uh, fabric sourcer 
a lot more time and a lot more due diligence to find a specific fabric or, or way of making a fabric than it would to not do it. We all genuinely believe in it and in the process that comes with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, great. That's um, it's a it's a it's an inspiring note to end on. So thanks, uh, thanks, Sammy. This is it was great talking with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure.